Olá, Lisboa. Um, my Portuguese is not very good. So we're here to talk about basically the internet is full of voices and that's why the internet came about was to give everyone a voice. But the thing is, is that not all of those voices matter. Um, so we're here to talk about that today. Now, I understand you have background in retail. You were the CEO of Ancestry.com and you were the president of Ticketmaster. Can, can you shed a little bit of light on that? Yeah, just I've uh, been around this for a long time and it's interesting that uh, many years ago, the major challenges facing brands and retail were mostly about logistics. Uh, they were really about how quick and easy the buying experience was and how broad the selection was. And that's led us to where we are today, where uh, consumers have so many choices. There are single brands in the running space, Nike, that have more SKUs today than it existed in the entire category just 30 years ago. Every single one of those products comes with tons of information, so much information I could go find, and reviews, and on and on, and it just winds up being noise. And just by show of hands, who here wakes up on any day and thinks, oh, I wish I could get advertised to some more? Yeah, no, no, con no consumer is saying, there, it, the demand for advertising is zero <laughs> in the increment. So all that noise together leaves consumers with a massive what to buy problem. Guide me, help me make the right decision about what to buy. And as I see it, that's the next giant opportunity for innovating and helping and succeeding in the retailer-consumer interaction. So I, I write about digital advertising, basically the ads that you see when you're surfing the web, uh, reading a story on the New York Times, and a lot of the people I talk to, they're like, relevant ads are good for the user, that's what they want, and I'm sitting there and I'm being like, no man, I run Adblock, I have Ghost Street going, I don't want to see any ads. And it, it seems like a total waste of money. Again, I write about this stuff and more money is going into it, but when I'm making my buying decision, it's, it's not an ad that I see. It's a lot of what I do is I, I start researching. I turn to experts on certain websites, like for example, with TVs. There's a website yeah. called Artings, and they're like the godfather of TV reviews. I value their opinion so much, so it's just like, Here's a website where the person is regarded as an expert by you know, consumers. How does a brand even compete with that? Like if you're Sony and you want to sell me a TV and this place gave it a bad review, like yeah. how do you get my money? What do you do? So I don't think it's magical. I think building on the theme that was just being touched on in this last panel, the trust theme, I, the central uh, building block for a brand going forward with respect to its commerce, how it sells. The central building block is trust. How do you have a relationship with your whole consumer base, but in particular with the people who are going to be sought out for recommendations about your products? How are those people, how are those things trusted? And unfortunately, a lot of brands go off on the wrong path early. They go after scale, for example, and they wind up paying people, essentially paying people to be their friends. And how many of us would think, uh, well, some of us might think to pay people to be our friends, but who wants to be friends with someone who has paid people to be their friends? That's not what our interaction is. And therefore, you have to, as a brand, you have to go build a relationship especially with people who are sought out for their expertise in your category. And I would just point out, for example, every single dominant growing brand that you can think of has done this well. Lego that was talking here earlier. Authentic, tied to their experts. Lululemon, Apple, 
Uh, I could go on and on. They've all built, and by the way, it's not just big brands, little brands, uh, uh, Yeti, which is a, a really progressive uh, cooler company, a tiny little brand in the U.S. Tufted mostly. Needle is one that we're Tufted we're Needle. Yeah. They, they've all centered around what are the authentic experts, not people they paid, but people who love their products. What are those people saying, and how do they amplify that? You know, the, the, it, it's funny that you just shared that. So I don't know how many of you in the audience are familiar with this mattress company. It's called Casper. They ship you a mattress to your door. And they're allegedly disrupting the mattress industry. Well, word got out that they bought the biggest review site. So mattress review sites, believe it or not, it's a thing and it's insanely lucrative. It's propped up from yeah. mattress delivery companies. So what Casper's done is, is that they don't like how one particular website, a popular one, was reviewing their mattress. So what they do, they bought it. Like, what does that do to like the consumer? Because now it's just like, I was actually in the market to buy a mattress. I thought that was sketchy, yeah. so I didn't, I didn't buy it. But like, again, well, this, how do you get this over that? This ties like, back to the whole theme we've heard over and over again here at Web Summit. It, it's, people are violating trust in a big way. There is a lot of fake out there. And uh, I was talking earlier in a round table just about the reality that when, uh, as adults, we all taught our children not to take the tabloid headlines too seriously, not to trust the tabloid headlines. Our children, millennials, many of you here would, could be my children, but our children are teaching us not to trust the Instagram post, not to trust the thing, the fake review, the fake news, and, and therefore it becomes incumbent upon every brand to start from this base of trust. And it's difficult in the same way that being a person of integrity is difficult. It's not that complicated. It just takes sacrifice from time to time. You have to have this trusted base to build from. Your experts, the people who are sought out for advice in your category, fanatical about your category, not necessarily, by the way, exclusively bound to you. In fact, probably not exclusively bound to you. They love a category, but they're willing to, and in fact, they're good at talking about the benefits of a product the trade-offs of a product and who it's right for, and therefore beyond reviews, beyond user-generated content, they start being the source of trusted recommendations. They can be recommend recommenders to the consumer. They can also be great for input back to the brand. Let me, let me ask you this though, like a lot of the people in this audience, they're with the startup uh, culture. There's a lot of startups over yep. here. There's the pitch competition going on. Now, I know a lot of those people, they wear a bunch of different hats. It's of course, just like of course. The, the CEO is also the social media director. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but like, you know, a lot of this advice that you're sharing, like it makes sense, but how do you even go about on building this base of trust when you're wearing so many different hats? Yeah. And you're, in, you know, you're, you're competing with someone like Amazon, which like, and we'll get to this, like, I'll spend more money and buy something on Amazon because if something goes wrong, they're gonna take care of me. Yeah. I'm a startup, how do I compete with that? Yeah. How, how do I build this trust? Yeah, so I, uh, first, start small. The same way anyone would advise you about, well, go reach out to one of your best customers and then 10 of your best customers and just start asking them things. Build a real relationship, and a relationship implies two-way, right? It implies sharing stuff with them, and it implies asking them for their input or for their content or things like that. Um, many people do that, and they might call it an advisory group when they're really young. Then they might build out as they grow as a brand to some kind of ambassador program or something like that that might involve tens or maybe a hundred people. But your goal is to get to thousands or tens of thousands of people with whom you share more deeply about your brand and whom you listen to more closely for their input, not all of them all at once, but in a way that you have a real relationship and they become the inspiration for your broader marketing. They become the people who are sought out and asked for advice by consumers about what to buy um, and they become your extended advocate network.
Okay, well, like, let me ask you this. Like, is it better to try and reach out and find similar people that are buying your product already, or do you think it's just better to tap into your audience, the people who are already buying your product, well, it depends to, to, on, to build this trust you know, Back that you're to your startup. About. Yeah. It, obviously, if you're launching a product, you, there is no one yet who's buying your product, so you want to start with people who are buying similar products in your category and learn from them. If there are people who've been buying your products for a long time and who love your products, then those can be a spectacular source, but different sources at different times. At the end, what, I, you know, my perception of what we're trying to focus on in this and, and, and address here it has to do with this, how do you connect a buyer and a seller in a world that's evolving like it is and where there is so much noise so much lack of trust, uh, so much, consumers who are so good at ignoring ads, and uh, I think that the real key is figuring out how do you power up this network of people who would be your advocates. They are your advocates. If you invited them inside, they'd be even better for you. How does, you know, we talked about like retail and like the shopping experience. We, we yep. kind of had conversations about this. Like, how does like an in-store experience help a brand versus something like what Amazon offers? Because a lot of people, they'll go to Best Buy or yeah. something, they'll get educated on a product, and then when it comes to make a purchase, they're pulling out their phones and they're buying it on Amazon. Yeah, no, like, that's exactly right. I, I, and I, How do you compete with it? Yeah. So let me talk first about retailers as a brand. So you can see that the retailers that are capitalizing on becoming the source of expertise, be becoming the trusted source of guidance, those are the retailers that are succeeding and are going to succeed, period. Uh, uh, you, you know, if you don't offer expertise as a retailer, if you don't offer real guided, trusted buying assistance, you are just a cost disadvantaged repository of inventory, uh, a horrible place to be. Now, uh, the good retailers are also figuring out how to tap into the reality that consumers can compare every price, consumers have tons of logistics choices. You can't pretend like that isn't true. That is going to be true. And I think Amazon plays, of course Amazon plays and will play a wonderful role in that. Brands that succeed will figure out how to have a relationship with they're expert customers that enables them to have a meaningful part of guiding the buying conversation, period. And, and where to buy is going to be less and less a problem for any of us. Look, it's already not a problem. No consumer has a where to buy problem <laughs> in the developed world. Yeah. We all have a what to buy problem, right? So, so kind of to play off of that, like, what, what do you think it was easier to buy something like maybe 20 years ago or today? Like when it comes to choice, like put on your consumer hat for yeah. a second. Like, which one's more complex? Like, do you think it's a lot harder oh, to buy something? It's despite, it, like, no, it's easier to buy something today logistically, of course, and we have so many more choices, which is a wonderful thing in some sense, but it leaves us with a bigger question about what's the right thing for me to buy. When I only had two choices, it was the, the comparisons were more stark. When I have 150 choices, I need to know what's the right thing for me. There's no such thing as the one right product. So what goes into the consumer choice? Like what's the thought process today that makes them pull the trigger? Like that's so different. Yeah, well, I, what I think is true today is, uh, and more than ever, and it will be true tomorrow, is the consumer looking for that point of recommendation and guidance that says, what is the right thing for me to buy? The buy people make all sorts of, of uh, uh, hay out of the buying journey is changing. It's fine, you can describe it differently, but it's still awareness, consideration, and purchase. And then the after purchase, which is important, um, what's different is at all of those stages, there are more choices, there is more noise, there is more difficulty making the right decision for me. Brands that succeed will figure out how to fill that gap. Totally. Uh, I think right now we're going to do, what is it, a Q&A right now? Sure. Q&A from the audience. Anyone have any questions? Oh, Someone I love that here. lights up. 
not just a bunch of heads. I will take you who's not raising their hand. No, I'm kidding. No questions. Who, uh, what mystery is there about what I'm saying? Or does it, yeah. We have a runner. No. I can hear you and I'll repeat it. Go ahead. You were saying if you don't have a product up yet to reach out to customers of similar products. Yeah. How do you I exactly suggest to reach out to them? Um, what would you say to them? Hey, here's my product. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, so if or you're, so could everyone hear that question? I should repeat it. Yeah, uh, if, if you don't have a product yet, how do you find the people who would be your customers? And also, what would you, like, do you ask them, what do you think about my product? Yeah. What do you, yeah, so in those cases, uh, you're probably building your product for people who are consuming a similar product, but you've, not, you've thought whatever exists today isn't good enough. This is what I'm building. So go find the people who use that product and ask them about whether this new product is meeting this new need you perceive. And uh, as they talk with you about it, let them guide how you would talk to the next consumer about it. Like you may have a really deep belief about the most valuable part of your product, uh, uh, and that may be completely different than the way that experts would say it's really valuable to them. And that's incredibly valuable insight. Yeah. What else? Yeah. He's coming. He's right there. Hi. Um, I work in advertising and I work with brands and companies and uh, it's quite often brands want to come across as authentic yes. and as caring about their customers. Yeah. But in real terms, in practical terms, they're too afraid to do that. They don't want to have a dialogue. They don't ha want to have to get into a conversation. Yeah. And they just want to say, here's my product, you have to buy it. We all know that's not how the world works anymore. So yeah. what's the right way to make brands aware and of that and get them into the, a real conversation? Yeah. What's the right way to get brands to understand the importance of authenticity and trust? Um, uh, look, I, I don't know of a better way than kind of hearkening back to the themes of this conference and that it is everywhere and, and just emphasizing the absolute urgency and, uh, of trust and that if you don't build on it, you can't go back. You, you, will have, you will have so damaged your brand that you will almost certainly not recover. Yeah. We're actually uh, out of time, but thank you guys so thank much. You thank all. you all so much.